glycolysis, which is going to be getting, uh, splitting, our goal is to first split glucose into two equivalent parts that we can then convert into acetyl-CoA, and we want to make as much ATP and NADH along the way as we can. I mentioned last time that glycolysis involves an investment phase where we're actually going to uh, use uh, some ATP, but in the end we're going to get it back entirely. We talked about this phosphorylation mechanism where we replace a weak phosphoanhydride bond in ATP with a stronger phosphoester bond in glucose 6-phosphate. This is quite downhill in energy. The next uh, reaction we finished up with last time is this isomerization from glucose to fructose. Now you're going to see in a little bit, uh, in fact we did talk about this last time, if I want to split glucose into two equal parts, it's not great to have an aldehyde here because I could conceivably break the bond between alpha and beta carbons via a retroaldol reaction, but if I did that in the current molecule, I'd split it into a four carbon piece and a two carbon piece, and that's likely going to require different machinery downstream, and so that's inefficient. And so I showed you how through two, through a series of tautomerization reactions where we first uh, make the enol, and then we notice that the enol that we made is actually an ene diol, uh, and that allowed us to switch entirely which oxygen was the carbonyl oxygen and uh, where the alpha carbon was. And so if we remove the proton from this OH group and then protonate on the alpha carbon, we get fructose, which is a ketone. And now, if you count your carbons, one, two, three, carbonyl carbon, alpha carbon, beta carbon, now that, um, that bond between alpha and beta carbons, if you did a retroaldol reaction, that would split the molecule up into two equivalent pieces. So there was purpose to this isomerization, and it was to get, it was to get the right functional groups in the right place so that you could, um, so that later on we can do a retroaldol reaction. Okay, questions so far about all of that? All right, let's dive in. Third reaction uh, is another sort of investment phase reaction. In this reaction, we're going to take fructose 6 phosphate, which we've drawn kind of like this. One, two, three, and so on. Uh, here's carbon four, five, and six. And we're going to use a second molecule of ATP. This is going to be sort of the same SN2-like phosphoanhydride to phosphoester reaction that we did before in uh, step one. And this is going to put a new phosphoester on carbon, on the OH group of carbon one. And you'll see in just a minute why we would want to do that. It also has to do with making sure that once we do the retroaldol reaction, we split the molecule up into two very similar pieces. Okay, uh, this, this reaction is also not reversible under physiological conditions. It's downhill by about four kilocalories per mole. Uh, the enzyme that catalyzes this reaction is a kinase and it's kind of fun to say, phosphofructokinase, uh, phosphofructose, and then kinase, you're adding another, uh, you're adding another phosphate group. This is now called fructose 1,6-bisphosphate.
Oops. Okay. So now, um, so that's, I'm not going to draw the mechanism of that because it's just a repeat of step one's mechanism only on a different OH group. All right. So now, <clears throat> what we're going to do is the retroaldol reaction. And in this reaction, we'll take fructose 1,6-bisphosphate and the enzyme that catalyzes this reaction is called aldolase, which is a fun name because that means it catalyzes the aldol reaction. Change in free energy for this reaction is basically zero. So uh, this is an equilibrium reaction, which we're not really surprised by because you've learned about the aldol being uh, an equilibrium reaction, meaning it can go forward and backward under similar conditions. Um, and I'll show you the products in a little bit. So we start with a cyclic hemiacetal. And in order for this reaction to go, we need to actually have the ketone there instead of the hemiacetal. So we're just going to open the hemiacetal. Uh, I'm not going to draw that mechanism because I think you could do it. Briefly, it's going to involve a base removing this proton and or an acid protonating this OH group, electrons kick down and leaving group leaves. Uh, but, the, and, but the open chain form we can draw in sort of exactly the same orientation, only it won't be cyclic anymore. Okay, uh, and again, I'm going to point out carbons one, two, three, four, five, and six. And then again, I'm going to point out that carbonyl carbon, alpha carbon, beta carbon with the bond between alpha and beta carbons being the one that could be made in an aldol reaction and that would be broken in the retroaldol reaction. All right, so what would the retroaldol reaction look like? Uh, you would have a base, remove the proton, <clears throat> from the oxygen. I'm showing you the mechanism I think that's typically done in bacteria. In eukaryotic cells it's a little bit different. You end up making an imine with this ketone first and then doing the reaction but we won't worry about that detail. Um, a base removes that proton whether it's in this step or whether it's a previous step or is part of the rate determining step all at once I'm not sure. Electrons can kick down to establish the carbonyl and then the electrons in the bond between alpha and beta are going to end up on the beta carbon. Notice that what we get from that process, and I'm going to try to draw it in the same orientation, is this aldehyde, and then this ketone enolate which can pick up a proton I guess I don't totally like where I put that oops and then we'll protonate that enolate with some acid, possibly the conjugate acid of our base. And then these are the two products that we're going to get. And now I'm going to draw them in a more, convention, uh, more conventional way where you can see the stereochemistry. Um, the one here, is called glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. 
Oops. Why don't I draw it the way it... And if you wanted to, you can fall, you could go back and confirm that the stereochemistry has to be this way. Um, but you can also just accept it as I've drawn it. These are carbons for five and six of my original glucose molecule, though from here on out we're going to call them carbons one, two, and three. And then our, uh, so this is glyceraldehyde uh, six phosphate. And then your other molecule is Oops. This sort of annoying one, dihydroxyacetone phosphate. And this is original carbons one through three of our glucose molecule. Uh, though, uh, we're going to switch things around uh, and actually convert in the next step this dihydroxyacetone phosphate into glyceraldehyde uh, three phosphate. Sorry, I don't know where the six came from. Okay, questions so far? Actually, maybe I'll highlight the carbons that were involved in each of these in the, in the starting materials, rather. Okay. So maybe now, hopefully, you can see why we would want to have made fructose 1,6-bisphosphate because after the retroaldol reaction, we now have two three-carbon units, both of whom have a phosphate group. And that's going to allow us to use the same downstream machinery. All right. So um, the difference between glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and dihydroxyacetone phosphate is analogous to the difference between fructose and glucose. One is an aldehyde and one is a ketone. Both of them have a, a hydroxy group on the alpha carbon. And when you see that structural pattern, that's an example of uh, a situation where you could convert one into the other through a tautomerization mechanism. So take a look at those two structures. Convince yourself that both are alpha hydroxy carbonyl compounds and then recall that above when we did the isomerization of glucose we started with an alpha hydroxy carbonyl compound we ended with a different alpha hydroxy carbonyl compound but we uh, did that through an ene diol intermediate <clears throat> so we can do the same thing here with dihydroxyacetone phosphate. <clears throat> the enzyme that catalyzes this reaction is called TIM. Uh, that's short for triose phosphate isomerase. And if you ever learn stuff about enzyme kinetics, TIM is one of the enzymes that is just as optimized really as nature can get an enzyme to be. It's sometimes called a perfect uh, enzyme. The kcals per mole, sorry. And uh, so this is slightly uphill in energy. That should make sense because ketones are more stable than aldehydes, but it's not uh, hugely uphill. <clears throat> The mechanism I'm not going to draw here because it is simply uh, 
two tautomerization reactions with a key ene diol intermediate. So it would be good practice for you to see if you could draw that mechanism here based on what we talked about before. But what this will do is it will convert our dihydroxyacetone phosphate into another molecule of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. And again, there's no need for any redox reagents. What uh, used to be the alcohol is now an aldehyde, and I'm not drawing correct things, sorry. We were missing a carbon. What used to be the uh, ketone is now a hydroxy group. What used to be a hydroxy group is now <clears throat> an aldehyde. Okay, questions about that? <clears throat> Okay, so that's basically our investment phase. Everything that happens from here on out uh, is going to regenerate what ATP we spent and then get and add even more on top of that. So we'll call this the payoff phase. And you got to remember that from this point on, we're going to show what happens to glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, but that we have two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, so everything from here on out happens twice. <clears throat> okay, so reaction six. <clears throat> involves, starts with glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. And maybe at this stage, actually, let me also show you what we're trying to get to. Um, our end point for glycolysis is going to be this molecule, pyruvate. Um, so, I mean, look at what we're going to have to do. We need this carbonyl to be oxidized to a carboxylic acid and then we need to somehow get a ketone from a diol. I mean this is a phosphoester but basically as far as this carbon is concerned that's an alcohol so we somehow need to get rid of this alcohol and make a ketone there. Alright so step six takes care of the carboxylic acid thing um, and the reaction mechanism is a little complicated. But we're going to go from uh, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and a separate phosphate group, which we can draw like this. And we're also going to use one equivalent, oops, that's not a charge, one equivalent of NAD plus. And <clears throat> when we're done, we're going to have NADH, and then we're going to have this phosphoglycerate, which is a weird name. We have oxidized the carbonyl carbon here to the oxidation state of a carboxylic acid, and we've loaded that carboxylic acid up with a phosphate group. So this is called 1,3 this phosphoglycerate. <clears throat> <clears throat> uh, 
All right, so I will draw the mechanism uh, for this reaction, but I want to just give you this overview so you can see strategically what we're doing. We had a goal of getting to pyruvate, so we are, we have oxidized carbon one to the carboxylic acid oxidation state, and we also made a mixed phosphoanhydride. And you should recognize this as being something uh, that's more reactive than a phosphoester. And this is actually an intermediate that's high enough in energy that we will be able later on to use this to make ATP. All right. So um, I guess before I show you the mechanism, the enzyme that does this is called glyceraldehyde-3-phosphate dehydrogenase. And again, that dehydrogenase word indicates that it's a redox reaction. Uh, the free energy change is basically minimal, basically nothing, essentially reversible. Um, and now let me show you the mechanism. <clears throat> so what, let's see, da, da, da. what likely happens is the phosphate attacks the carbonyl carbon of the aldehyde as uh, a nucleophile, and that gives you this tetrahedral intermediate. So, so far that's just carbonyl chemistry, which you've seen before. Here is the tetrahedral intermediate. Um, and then at this stage, you know, back when we were doing carbonyl chemistry, we'd look and we'd say, hey, you've really got perhaps no good leaving groups except the phosphate, so we would just have electrons kick down and kick off the phosphate, because of course, having hydride leave as a leaving group would seem to be quite a red flag, but we happen to have held in the enzyme active site NAD+, plus, and it's sitting close, ready, and waiting to accept a hydride. So electrons kick down and hydride gets delivered, handed off directly to that paracarbon of NADH, and then that gives you your product. Um, I'm being a little sloppy with the proton transfers. Uh, probably after the phosphate group uh, attacks, that other proton comes off. Oops. <clears throat> and then, of course, here is uh, NADH. So that's already payoff number one. We made NADH, which can go to the electron transport chain. Okay. All right, questions about that step? The only, yeah, go ahead. Is it working out like with the test that makes no structure? Is it important for the, on the test to know the structure of NAD plus? My guess is that if, once you've worked your way through these mechanisms enough, you'll, you'll be able to, to know that. I don't care that you know the rest of it, but this is sort of the business end or the warhead of the molecule, and it's good to be familiar enough with that that you don't have to look it up. Okay, what else? It's like testimony meeting or something, huh? <laughs> Actually, maybe you guys don't have that problem. I remember in our freshman ward, you had to like get up and go sit on the stand immediately after the bishopric member said amen in order to get the chance to bear your testimony. I also remember on the first testimony meeting of my freshman year, there were some people that this one dude actually took the mic off of the pole and started walking around like, <laughs> like he was doing stand-up. Um, 
still do that, by the way. Just... <clears throat> uh, okay. Nothing you want to ask about that? All right. So now uh, step, step seven <clears throat> is where we're going to recoup our um, ATP that we spent. Here's glyceraldehyde 3, I'm sorry, 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. And you've got this unstable mixed anhydride where you can think of all of this as being a good leaving group if it left it would leave as the carboxylic acid and that's a decent uh, the negative charge is stabilized by resonance and then uh, the other partner is ADP and I won't draw all of the ADP molecule, just draw it like that. Uh, this would be the beta uh, phosphate group of ADP. And we're just going to do a direct sort of SN2 reaction where these electrons attack the phosphorus and the leaving group leaves. Okay, and uh, that is also a reversible reaction. The change in free energy is zero, <clears throat> and uh, I mean, maybe this highlights sort of how far we've come. We've made an intermediate that is so unstable that it's easy to make ATP from it. We got to the point where, again, again with the low, okay, apparently I should just charge it frequently. Um, so we've gotten to the point where it's actually very fast for us to, or it's very easy and uh, it's not uphill in energy to make ATP. Um, sometimes people call this substrate level phosphorylation uh, because you're making an ATP molecule not through uh, the proton gradient and the ATP synthase in mitochondria, but rather you're making it directly from a molecule involved in glycolysis. The enzyme, and this is kind of funny, this is a case where the enzyme is actually named for the backwards reaction. The enzyme is called phosphoglycerate kinase because the product is phosphoglycerate. Glycerate refers to the three carbon uh, aspects acid with OH groups on carbons 2 and 3, and the phospho refers to the uh, phosphoester there. And then the other reactive partner is ATP. I told you the delta G for this reaction is zero, so it's just as valid to go from he <coughs> sorry, here backwards. And this has advantages, right, because there's a process in cells called gluconeogenesis. And so if you can maintain an equilibrating pool of both of these, this allows you to go forwards and backwards as needed based on the, the needs of the cell. For cases where, um, where the reaction is irreversible, like the few that we showed you before, uh, gluconeogenesis will do something different and use a different set of enzymes. Uh, the other useful thing about having some steps be reversible and some steps be irreversible is uh, once you commit a molecule to an irreversible step, like you've used it. And so the irreversible steps are sort of like gatekeepers for the process, and they can be highly regulated to prevent uh, using glucose when it's needed elsewhere. All right, so phosphoglycerate and ATP. Now remember that happens two times, so we just broke even. And uh, the mechanism, again, is sort of an SN2-like mechanism where, uh, and we're trading one mixed phosphoanhydride, which is pretty unstable, with another, a new phosphoanhydride in ATP.
So swapping out one weak bond for another, and that's why delta G is basically zero. All right. What else? Okay, step eight is going to involve a little switcheroo. We're going to start with uh, phosphoglycerate, and technically, because that phosphate group is on the third carbon, we'll call it 3-phosphoglycerate. Uh, and then we're going to move that phosphate group over to form 2-phosphoglycerate. And you may be thinking, okay, why on earth would I do that? And you'll have to wait and see. Uh, having this phosphate group be this close to the carboxylic acid and that, and that electrostatic repulsion there is going to be important for our second uh, substrate level phosphorylation event. Um, I'm not going to show you the mechanism for this one because it's a bit complicated. So do not worry about this mechanism. There will not be a question on... I'm doing this because I don't want to answer the question in the future, do we have to know the mechanism of step 8 in glycolysis? Because the answer is no. Got it? <laughs> on step 8. And here is blood, signed in blood, sealed and delivered. There you go. Um, this, the enzyme that does this is called phosphoglycerate mutase. Mutase just refers to the fact that a group is moving over. The mechanism is a little bit complicated. The reaction is reversible. Uh, the change in free energy is pretty small. Uh, and it basically involves a histidine side chain and... and <clears throat> It's uh, complicated enough that we don't really need to worry about it. All right. Next step is going to be a dehydration step because uh, you have an OH group here and you have an alpha proton there. That alpha proton should be removable because it's uh, adjacent to a carbonyl. So, so the reaction we're going to do now is going to be basically one that uh, it, it's basically the same as a dehydration reaction following the aldol. So here is 2-phosphoglycerate. <clears throat> Here's your proton first. A base will remove that proton to give you the enolate, and again, you're gonna the, you're gonna have functional groups in the active site that are gonna help this happen. And then, once you've got that uh, enolate, the electrons will kick down and. OH minus will leave as a leaving group, probably picking up a proton on the way out. Um, and this gives you phosphoenol pyruvate. And if you're paying attention to where we need to get, as I've shown you, we're almost there. If we can get rid of this phosphate group, we would have an enol, which could tautomerize to the ketone, and we'd be done. Okay. Um, the enzyme that does this, kind of a fun name, enolase, because it's basically a tautomerization reaction. Um, this step is also reversible. The free energy change is minimal. And the mechanism, as I've shown you here, is basically... E1CB style dehydration. 
meaning you make the conjugate base first and then you eliminate. Uh, okay, so that was step nine and step 10 we're done and all of this has been a buildup to this phosphoenol pyruvate which I'll draw again here and this molecule is relatively high in energy and there's a couple of reasons for that there's the electrostatic repulsion between the carboxylate negative charge and the phosphate group negative charges but then there's also the fact that you've uh, tied up this this portion of the molecule in a less stable enol form when it would prefer to be in the keto form. Remember we learned that carbon-carbon pi bonds are less stable than carbon-oxygen pi bonds. Uh, that's because oxygen's more electronegative and electrons that are shared with oxygen are therefore lower in energy um, and held closer to the nucleus. So yeah, you've got two things going against it. You've got uh, the enol form that would prefer to be the keto form, and then you've got electrostatic repulsion between the phosphate group and the carbonyl, uh, or the carboxylate group. So this is going to be another example of phos or substrate level phosphorylation, and I'm going to abbreviate um, ATP. This would be the beta phosphate group of ADP rather and the mechanism here is going to be simple what we've seen before for this kind of thing we will attack the phosphorus <clears throat> and that will and uh, we will pick up a proton on the oxygen as uh, this group is leaving. So you can think of everything I've circled there as a decent leaving group. And again, the reason why it would be a decent leaving group is your relieving charge uh, repulsion here. <clears throat> um, so what you get after that step is ATP, and then you get the enol, of pyruvate and then that will easily and quickly tautomerize and I'm not going to draw this mechanism because I think you should be able to do it on your own without a lot of trouble that will tautomerize to the more stable keto form and this is now pyruvate that's a U. So, and again, we've made two molecules of uh, ATP there. <clears throat> okay, so that concludes glycolysis. Here's our profit of ATP molecules. And then up here was our profit of NADH molecules. And again, that will have happened two times. Okay. All right, any questions you want to ask? Go ahead. Yeah, so for step 10, right, did you say that, like, you can just kick off the phosphate group of an ADP molecule? Why doesn't it? I'm sorry, you're wondering. Uh, the bond next to the phosphate group, why doesn't it just go to the oxygen and kick off the phosphate group? Okay, so I think the question is, why can't this happen and the phosphate group leaves? Well, first, if that happened, the phosphate group wouldn't leave with an oxygen. You'd be putting electrons on the phosphorus, which is a different species. Second, you'd be leaving a positive charge on that uh, neighboring carbon. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. What else? Okay, that's kind of laborious. A lot of different, uh, a lot of different reaction mechanisms but none of them really should be new at this point. They're just stitching together different things that you've seen before. <clears throat> and in addition to sort of knowing the mechanisms, knowing the structures, the intermediates, and what they're called, and what the enzymes are, it's, it's easier to remember if you, um, 
pay attention to the chemical logic of what's going on. Remembering that our goal is to get to pyruvate from a six carbon starting material and, and to recover as much NADH and uh, ATP as we can along the way, then it becomes a little bit clearer why the steps have to work the way they do. Everything in the investment phase, which we talked about, is all about positioning phosphate groups and carbonyls such that you can do the retroaldol reaction to convert a six carbon uh, molecule into two very similar three carbon units. And then uh, because you put the phosphates in the right place and because both of these are alpha hydroxycarbonyl compounds, you can tautomerize via the ene diol intermediate and then you get two of the same thing. So that's the logic of the first sort of the, the, the investment phase. We want to trim glucose down into two equal molecules. And everything else from this point on happens twice. Um, <clears throat> we generate a molecule of NADH as we, as NADH as we oxidize the aldehyde to the carboxylic acid. Uh, but, but we don't just oxidize it to the carboxylic acid. We make the uh, mixed phosphoanhydride, which allows us to recover ATP because once we make the weak phosphoanhydride, we have a good leaving group here. And that's the substrate level phosphorylation step. We've paid off our debt at that stage. And then everything else is about getting this phosphate group on 3-phosphoglycerate into the right spot so that you can uh, make the last molecule of ATP. So we move the phosphate group over. Again, I didn't tell you how we do that. But doing so allows us to make phosphoenol pyruvate <clears throat> which we can then do another substrate level phosphorylation reaction uh, where we combine the electrostatic repulsion with the, en, uh, the enol to keto form tautomerization to make another two molecules of ATP. And at this point with pyruvate, we're ready to take that to the citric acid cycle. So you thought you, thought you were overwhelmed. We've still got miles to go before we sleep, before we've converted all three of those carbons in pyruvate into CO2. Okay? All right. Questions? Your cells are doing this all the time. Go ahead. Will we be ignoring the amino acid side chains in the enzymes? Yes. Uh, your text may not. Uh, but that's, that stuff's pretty interesting, um, but most important are going to be the changes in the chemical bonds. Yeah? Do I want you to remember the names of each of the molecules in the enzymes? Yes, I do. Let me repeat that. I do want you to know the names of all of the molecules and the enzymes. Dang it. <laughs> on the other hand, once you do it, th that kind of question is easy to answer on the test. What is that? Oh, it's 3-phosphoglycerate. OK, moving on with our life. There's no existential crisis related to that particular question. <clears throat> OK, what else? Yes? Ah, yes. What percentage of the final is this versus other stuff? Um, the most useful thing I can say is that the final will contain somewhere between 100 and 0 percent of the material in this part of the class and the corresponding amount from the other part of the class. It's going to be comprehensive. I think more of it will be on this last section, but uh, there'll still be stuff from before. Anything I could tell you about percentages would be meaningless because I haven't written it yet. So it would not be accurate. But yeah. What else? Is that another hand? Go ahead. Is there any kind of standardized final you have to take like you took? Ah, uh, yes. Is there any kind of standardized final you have to take like in uh, like you did maybe in 351? Uh, no, I will be writing the final myself. My colleagues, some some of my colleagues like to give the ACS final because uh, it allows 
them to assess sort of how well the class went versus uh, a recognized standard. I don't really like to do it because in my experience, students panic a little bit about it and they feel like they need to go out and buy a uh, review book for the ACS exam and I just feel like that's not worth the effort. So, so you're stuck with me. Some of you may be disappointed. You may have been looking for uh, looking for a different, looking for a reprieve. Yeah? Is it going to be in the testing center? Will it be in the testing center? That is my plan, yes. Okay. Perfect. Just open that whole time. Then. It should be open that whole time. That way you won't, if you don't want to, once finals week starts, you don't need to see me and I don't need to see you. We can just part, part ways amicably or something like that. <laughs> Seriously, you're always, always welcome to drop into my office. I love you guys. I love seeing you guys. But I understand the feeling may not be mutual. And so, yes, you can take the, <laughs> you can take the test and ride off into the sunset. All right. So what we're going to do now is bridge between the uh, pyruvate and the citric acid cycle. So uh, some people ask, is this part of glycolysis or is this part of the citric acid cycle? The answer is neither. It's just the bridge between the two. The goal is to convert pyruvate, which is a three carbon molecule. We want to convert that into acetyl-CoA. And remember, acetyl-CoA is our, our uh, prized and precious intermediate because we can take that into the citric acid cycle. So um, the thing that does this is a multi-enzyme complex called the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. And the mechanism here is interesting and complicated. Um, so, hmm. uh, why not? Let's just scribble it down as fast as we can. Um, now we'll just pick that up next time. We're about a lecture behind. So, have a good day. I'll see you on Wednesday.